This is Erica Cooksey, and welcome to my presentation on the stack versus the heap, or memory management in C and C++. So by the end of this presentation, you should be able to answer the following questions. First and foremost, what's the difference between stack memory and heap memory? Uh, where are memory leaks caused? Are they caused on the stack or on the heap, and how can we prevent them in our code? If we try to fill a buffer past its capacity, why don't we just allocate extra memory on the end? So if we have a 10-byte buffer and we try to stuff 11 or more bytes in it, um, why don't we just grow the buffer to accommodate those extra bytes? We probably have plenty of memory. Why does a buffer overflow cause the whole program to crash? Again, uh, we probably have plenty of memory. Uh, why does it matter if we just allocate a couple extra bytes on the end of an array? Why can't we allocate an array with a non-constant such as a user-supplied index? So here's an example snippet of code uh, that will not compile. We have the user enter an array size. Uh, we save that to an integer called r size, and we try to declare an array like so using r size um, to give the number of items that need to be in the array. This won't compile. Why not? Why can't the compiler figure out something this simple? So we'll start our presentation with some basic definitions. First off, the heap. Uh, the heap is a large pool of operating system memory and it's used in dynamic memory allocation. Uh, in C++ we use the new keyword, if we're using old style C we use the malloc keyword and those allocate memory on the heap. The stack, and first off, keep in mind that even though the stack does resemble the data structure stack, we're not talking about just the data structure, we're talking about uh, the stack as it relates to memory management. So each process gets its own stack, that's what we're talking about here, the processes stack. And we're only going to talk about single-threaded processes today just for the sake of simplicity. So each process gets its own stack. Just like the data structure, a, pro a process's stack is last and first out. So like the stack of books here, uh, the last book that you put on top is the first one that you're going to take off. And it's a contiguous block of memory uh, within the process's address space. Um, so let's see, the stack consists of stack frames. So each stack frame contains the parameters to a function, its local variables, and the data necessary to recover the previous stack frame. Uh, so when a function is called, a frame for that function is pushed onto the stack. When the function is done executing, we pop the stack frame and return to the caller. So when we call a function, we grow the stack by pushing uh, the stack frame for that function on, on top. And when we're done with it, uh, the stack shrinks by popping it off we return to the caller, which is now on top of the stack. So the stack contains very high performance memory, and there's usually a fixed limit of stack memory that you could allocate for a particular program. So here's an example that shows two different ways of allocating an array. One goes on the stack, and one goes on the heap. Uh, for the stack, we just declare an array like this with the constant size and the index. And with the heap, we actually use the new keyword and it, this, in this case, is um, a static value, but we could actually use a dynamic one, like one that we received from the user, like we saw in the previous code example, and we can allocate dynamically on the heap. We have plenty of space in the heap, um, and we don't need to know at compile time how much we're going to use. So we're going to start with a short review of basic chip architecture and assembly language calls. Uh, this is going to be a very, very short explanation. Um, just to go over what we need to, to understand these concepts. So what is assembly? I mean, think of assembly as machine instructions. Uh, C is a higher level language which gets translated into assembly by the compiler. Uh, the key point here is that the assembly language tells the computer exactly what to do and exactly how to do it. Um, so in C, C or C++, we'll just say something a little more high level in general, like allocate memory or perform addition. In assembly, we're going to drill down to the specifics of uh, put this byte from this address in memory into that register or jump to this location in memory. Uh, these do the exact same things. We'll go over the assembly code in a minute. We see that the assembly is a little more complicated. Um, assembly language is non-portable, and it's specific to that particular platform and chipset. So if you have the exact same C code, uh, the, it'll be compiled into assembly language that's different for, say, an Intel 64-bit CPU. It'll be different for a Motorola 68000 CPU, even with the exact same C code. Uh, but it's easier to program in C, as you could tell. Uh, the code's easier to read, and it's more portable. Just as an aside, very high-level languages that run on a virtual machine, such as Java, get translated into a proprietary sort of assembly. 
uh, in the case of Java, it'd be Java bytecode, and that can run on that per particular virtual machine. So let's talk about registers. Uh, we're going to define them as extremely high performance memory that's located directly on the chip, or the CPU. Uh, general purpose registers, we use these conventions for, for example, an Intel and other CPUs, EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. We use these per for performing optim uh, operations on data. So because these are very high speed registers being directly on the chip, we won't directly work with data while it's in memory. We'll usually take uh, the data out of memory, put it into the registers, perform our operations there, and then put it back into memory. Because these are very, very high speed. We also have special purpose registers which have a designated purpose for each one. So the examples that we're going to talk about with relation to the stack are ESP, which is the stack pointer that always points to the top of the stack and it's manipulated by a push and pop instructions. We have EBP which is the base pointer. It's a, a little easier to think of it as the frame pointer. And with the frame pointer local variables and parameters within a stack frame are referenced by their offset to EBP. And EBP is fixed for that particular frame whereas the stack pointer can move as items are pushed and on and popped off of the stack. That's why we use EBP within that particular stack frame. And ESI and EDR are respectively the source instruction register and the destination instruction registers. And we use these to keep track when we're calling functions and returning from them. So we know where to go, where to come back. So here's a very basic review of assembly language calls. And it's very, very abridged. We're not going to cover uh, IO interrupts or anything. Just cover what, we're, what we need to know for this. So assembly language uh, calls can be of the form opcode and then destination source. So for example, move EAX1 moves the value 1 into the EAX register. They can also be of the form opcode and then operand. So for example, a jump instruction is like the assembly equivalent of a go to. Uh, if we do jump to this hex address, it, ju it just jumps to that address in memory and starts executing the code there. And in this case, the hex address is uh, hexadecimal dead beef. We also have stack related mnemonics such as push, pop, call, and ret, ret or return. Push writes the value from the register to the stack. So push grows the stack by taking the values from the red register that we're pushing and putting it on the stack. Pop writes the value to the register from the stack, removing it from the stack. So push grows it, pop shrinks it. Call, uh, we do it in the form of call and then function. It's very similar to a jump, except that it returns to the caller when done. And call is generally accompanied by pushing values from the function's frame onto the stack. And ret returns from the function that was called. And this is generally accompanied by popping the function's frame off of the stack, and returning to the caller. So enough PowerPoint, let's see some code in action. So now we're actually going to look at some code. So what's nice about the Visual Studio IDE is that we can actually view the disassembly of the C code in line with the C code and we can also look at the contents of the registers, look at the contents of the memory, all kinds of fun stuff. So here we've defined a very simple function called my function. It takes x as a parameter and returns uh, 1 plus x. So let's step into this here. We can view the disassembly. And when we view the disassembly, we can see that here's our call to the function. We step into that. And here's everything that happens when we call a function. This is everything that we talked about before. Calling the function involves a lot of pushes. Returning from the function involves a lot of pops. So when we enter the function, we copy the contents of the stack pointer into the frame pointer, or base pointer, EBP. Uh, we push the base pointer onto the stack, in addition to the source instruction, the destination instruction, all that gets pushed on the stack. Uh, the local variables are allocated by subtracting their size from the from the stack pointer. So after we do all that, we can finally execute the body of the function, pop all of our uh, values off the stack for this stack frame, and then return. So let's see. So we go here, we've already done everything, and then we can return from our function. So let's look at something that's a little bit more interesting. We have a function here called set buffer. Now what set buffer does is we allocate a local buffer on the stack that has uh, 10 bytes of memory. It's 10 characters. One character is one byte. And it receives as a parameter um, 
another character buffer, and a number of characters. So it allocates on the stack a 10 byte buffer, and then we copy the input buffer into that uh, local one, and then just return. So we build our project. Now here we see that we're creating a new 10 byte buffer in the main, just full of a bunch of capital B's, and then calling set buffer with that and the number 10. So here we step in, view our disassembly. Here's all of our pushes that we talked about. create the, the new buffer, everything's fine. We call mem copy to, to copy the 10 bytes from the input into the, the 10 bytes in the local buffer, and everything is fine. So here we can see the addresses of all of our pointers, or not all of our pointers, all of our registers. So local buff is this address. When we view it in the memory, this will have to actually type it in. see our buffer. We perform the mem copy, it puts all the b's in there. Uh, the hexadecimal ASCII value of b is 42, so that's what we have. And we can see that it's on the stack, it's right next to the frame pointer, base pointer, it's next to EDI, it's next to everything that um, that's in that stack frame. It's part of why it's very high performance, it's very compact. If we call the function, we can return, everything goes just fine. Now, what if we do things a little bit differently? And instead of passing 10 bytes into the 10 byte buffer, we put 255 bytes into that 10 byte buffer. Now what do we think happens? So we're going to debug into this. Step into it. View our disassembly. So now look, local buff is still very close to EBP, EDI, all the other um, pointers that, that relate to our current stack frame. Because we think that all we're going to need in this local buff here, all we're going to need is 10 bytes. Um, so we've allocated basically just enough space for that. So now here's our call to mem copy. Here's local buff. Let's put the value in the memory window here. step over, make all our calls that we need to do to call mem copy. So now that buffer is all full of 42's, but what happens to everything else that's within that frame? Here's EBP, it used to hold a hexadecimal address that we would need um, for knowing all the offsets from the frame pointer. That's all full of 42's. Our destination instruction register is all full of 42's. We have no idea where anything is because all of these important registers are now all full of 42's and if we continue trying to execute we get a stack corruption. No surprise there. So now say if instead of allocating all of this on the stack, we allocate it on the heap. We use the new operator that we talked about before and we use numchars which comes into the function as our parameter to dynamically allocate it. Here we go. Step into it. So here we've instantiated it on the heap. So you can see our EBP, our EDI, everything else. We see that the address of heap buff is way somewhere else so out in the pool of operating system memory. We have plenty of space. It's nowhere near the other uh, pointers on the stack frame. We don't have to worry about overwriting anything and we can dynamically allocate it uh, at runtime. So we perform the mem copy. Now one thing that you may have noticed is that as soon as that stack frame is popped, that memory that we had in local buff automatically gets deallocated. Um, when we're allocating heap memory, we're responsible for cleaning up after ourselves, and that's why every time we call the new uh, keyword, we also have to call the delete keyword when we're done with it to deallocate that memory. Otherwise, we just continue allocating memory and we never um, give it up. And this program runs just fine. So now let's go back to our original question that we talked about. We talked about what's the difference between stack memory and heap memory. So where are memory leaks caused on the stack or on the heap? 
uh, clearly they're caused on the heap because we can allocate first off lots more memory and we, we're responsible for our own memory deallocation. Uh, in order to prevent them from happening we're going to have to deallocate our own memory every time we allocate it as soon as we're done with it. If we try to fill a buffer past its capacity why don't we just allocate extra memory on the end? Well, we're talking about a, st a buffer on the stack here. We can't allocate extra memory on the end because we haven't accounted for needing it there and we have a bunch of other um, important information uh, in that memory location, such as the, the frame pointer, the destination address, the source address, everything else. Why does a buffer overflow cause the whole program to crash? Well, when we call ret, we try to go back to the caller that the address of the caller has been overwritten by some garbage data that we overflowed from past our buffer. Why can't we allocate an array with the user supplied index? Because we need to know at compile time how much space we need for that buffer on the stack. So when do you use which? Stack is extremely high performance and it's automatically deallocated by the program. So we use a stack when we can. However, the heap gives us access to a lar much larger pool of memory and it's dynamic. We can dynamically allocate it, uh, so even if we don't know the size of our buffers or classes at, at compile time, we don't have to worry about that until the program actually runs. That was my presentation. I hope you found it informative.